fellow doctors. My name is Dr. Jason Chin. I'm a medical officer with the National Cancer Society, currently pursuing my master's in public health with UM. It's my great privilege to be your moderator this lovely afternoon. So about this series, it's named on behalf of our founder, Dato Sri Dr. S. K. Damalingam, who is Malaysia's first oncologist. This is a monthly CME on Doc Reed regarding topics pertaining to the cancers of the month. It's usually at the end of the month, and today is no exception as we talk about lung cancer. Right? NCSM is an NGO non-profit, 100% relying on donations. We focus on education, awareness, screening, and cancer support. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave the comments in the Doquity app. And the Q&A session will be at the end of the session and will last about 30 minutes or so. Any questions asked throughout the CME will be addressed during the Q&A. So without further ado, let me have the great privilege of introducing our speaker for today. Dr. Sum is currently a clinical oncologist in uh, Penang General Hospital. She completed her undergrad from University College Dublin and URUMC in 2013. She obtained her Master's of Clinical Oncology from UM in 2022, followed by the attainment of Fellowship of the Royal Colleges of Radiologists, FRCR, in Clinical Oncology in 2023. She's also a member of the Malaysian Oncological Society and European Society of Medical Oncologists, ESMO. Uh, so her speaker profile is actually quite simple, but when you actually see her CV and you actually see her accolades for the past year, right, it's actually numerous from research, from clinical trials, from even being speakers for a multitude of conferences and symposiums. She's actually a very amazing person. So without further ado, I'm going to let Dr. Som take the floor and she's going to teach us about the demystifying lung cancer, a primary care importance. Right, Dr. Som, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Jason, for the very kind introduction. Uh, first of all, just let me share my screen first. Okay, I hope you all can see my screen by now. Oh, sorry. Slides. Okay. okay, thank you, National Cancer Society Malaysia, for the invitations. And thank you, the audience, for spending time on a Saturday morning to log into this webinar. So today, I will be talking about demystifying lung cancer, a primary care importance. So I believe that every one of us recognize that lung cancer is a global problem. It's a leading cause of cancer-related death worldwide and resulting in one in five in all cancer-related death. And it's a commonest cancer death in men as well. So today I'll be talking more on the overview of lung cancer, followed by the importance and role of primary care for early detection of lung cancer, the health disparities and access to care for lung cancer and referral guidelines, myth and misconceptions about lung cancer. And towards the end of my talk, I will touch a little bit on the overview of management and treatment options for lung cancer with the latest advancements, clinical trials, and future directions of our lung cancer treatment. Because you can, as you can see, this is a very broad topic. Please feel free to stop me if you have uh, burning questions in between my presentations, or else we will leave the Q&A to the end of the talk. All right, so let's start. So if you look across the world, if you can see from here, the incidence of lung cancer cases and mortality of lung cancers actually is the highest in Asia as compared to the rest of the world. Okay, top in the list in Asia, very common lung cancer. So this is true when we look at the WHO data. When we look at the data that published on the estimated age standardized mortality rates across the world in 2020 for both males and females, lung cancer is top on the list and again, Eastern Asia has higher mortality rates as compared to the other parts of the world. And if we look at the estimated number of new lung cancer cases in 2020, you notice that almost half of the world lung cancer cases occurred in Eastern Asia. And of all the cancer deaths in Eastern Asia, about one quarter of them are actually due to lung cancer. So high incidence and high mortality in Asia region. What about in Malaysia? Malaysia, we have a total population of about 33 million people. The number of new cancer cases per year is about 48,000. And the cancer incidence in Malaysia is expected to double by the year of 2040. And based on the Malaysia National Cancer Registry report 2012 to 2016, if you can see from here, lung cancer is one of the top three commonest, lung, uh, commonest cancer that diagnosed in Malaysia, followed uh, after breast and colorectal cancer. Then for lung cancer, it's commoner to be seen in male, in Chinese race as compared to other races, and the incidence would peak at around 70 years old. So next we will talk about the types of lung cancer. 
So broadly, lung cancer can be divided into non-small cell lung cancer, which make up about 75 to 80% of the lung cancer. And also small cell lung cancer, we make up about 15 to 20% of the lung cancer cases. Then for the non-small cell lung cancer, it can be further subdivided into adenocarcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma. And for adenocarcinoma, in this day and age, is insufficient to stop the diagnosis just at adenocarcinoma. We need to look at the molecular subtypes to guide us in terms of the therapeutic options for the patients. So in a hospital Pulau Penang, once the patient diagnosed with the lung adenocarcinoma, there would be a reflex testing on the EGFR mutation, which would be sent to the molecular lab in HKL for processing. And upon a clinician request, the other mutations that can be tested includes ELT or ROSE uh, rearrangement. This is for adenocarcinoma. Whereas for squamous cell carcinoma, uh, we hardly see uh, mutations uh, in squamous cell carcinoma, but sometimes we do see uh, in a few very rare cases. So for lung cancer in Malaysia, which one is the commoner subtypes? In the past, the commoner subtypes is the squamous cell carcinoma for NSCLC, but in recent years, adenocarcinoma seems to take over to become the more common uh, lung cancer cell types. And this change in the distribution of lung cancer cell types was unlikely to be due to a change in smoking pattern, as the proportions of our lung cancer patients who smoke were actually quite similar. To illustrate that better, uh, I would like to share this slide. Uh, it's actually performed a study performed by Prof. Liam from UNMC to look at the distribution of lung cancer cell types during two different periods in UNMC. It's kind of old study, but it's good to look at. If you just focus on the front row from the year of 1960s to 1970s, you will see the commonest lung cancer subtype is uh, squamous cell carcinoma. As compared to the back row from the years of 1990s, you will see adenocarcinoma, adenocarcinoma has become the commonest lung cancer subtypes. So now we all know that adenocarcinoma is the commonest subtype of lung cancer. And another distinct feature of adenocarcinoma is, if you look at this pie chart, majority of our lung cancer patients in small cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma would be smokers. But there will be a portion of non-smokers uh, in adenocarcinoma. And this increase in adenocarcinoma in non-smokers is particularly observed in Asian countries, including Malaysia. So for the molecular subtypes of lung adenocarcinoma, there are a lot of uh, driver mutations that, that can be detected. But the most common uh, would be EGFR. As you can see from this uh, next slide on the mutation landscape of lung adenocarcinoma uh, across East and West are different. If you can see the pie chart on the right side, the EGFR, almost half of the uh, lung adenocarcinoma would harbor these driver mutations in Asian regions. And it's more prevalent compared to Caucasian populations. And invariably, I will find this in non-smokers as compared to smokers. So when we talk about smoking, we take a look on the smoking prevalence of lung cancer patients in East Asia and Western countries. For males, in the blue bars, as you can see, generally, I think across West and East, the smoking rates are high. Yeah, but for female, if you look at the green color bar, if compared to European and USA, you will see that in Asian countries, there are actually not many smokers among uh, female patients who are diagnosed with uh, lung cancers. So in, in other words, this implies that in the Asian female patients who are diagnosed with lung cancer, there are a big number of them are actually non-smokers. So for smoking rate in Malaysia, one quarter of Malaysians aged 15 years or older were smokers in 2015. And we all know that smoking would, in, uh, would impose a nine to 10 fold risk uh, increment for lung cancer, whereas heavy smokers had a, lead, a risk of at least 20 fold risk. Then for those uh, Asian female patients who are non-smokers, we will find them diagnosed at younger age as compared to the other uh, lung cancer subtypes. Why is that so? I think as for now, the carcinogenesis is poorly understood. Like why are we seeing more and more Asian female patients, non-smokers diagnosed with a lung adenocarcinoma? So in my search for the answer, I have found this very interesting uh, poster and publications later on, uh, which actually look at 
the air pollution index, whether it correlates with the incidence of lung cancer in this group of patients. So for this study, the authors actually concluded that compared with ever smoking patients with lung cancer, non-smoking patients had a strong association with being female, being Asians, and having air pollution exposures. So we can actually say that these patients, uh, most of the most of these patients, one of the etiology could be due to the air pollution. We, we cannot blame the smoking, then we blame the air pollution. But I guess it's difficult for us to draw a conclusion just based on one study, but it's interesting to know uh, there is a publication on that. All right, so now we'll move on to the lung cancer stage at diagnosis. So from here, we can see that majority of our lung cancer patients are diagnosed at, at one stage. Almost 80% of them diagnosed at stage four for both males and females. And the relative survival of lung cancer patients in Malaysia, as, you, as the stage goes higher up, then the survival will be poorer. And when we take a look on the other lung cancer subtypes, it compared to lung cancer, relative survival of the lung cancer as compared to other cancer subtypes is the poorest. Yeah, short survival, high incidence. So how do we stage lung cancer? So we have these DNM classifications. We stage a lung cancer based on the tumor size, T, uh, the nodal regions, N, as well as the metastasis, whether there's involvement of uh, distant uh, organs. So rule of thumb, early stage lung cancer, stage one, small primarily, less than three centimeter. Stage two lung cancer, larger primary, with or with not the involvement, uh, with or without the involvement of the ipsilateral hyalur nodes. For stage three lung cancer, there will be involvement of the medial sinus limb nodes and two disease or the contralateral lung limb nodes and three disease. They automatically become a stage three cancer. For stage four cancer is when the cancer cell has spread to the contralateral lungs to the purer or to the distant organs. So this is a rule of thumb for us uh, to classify our lung cancer based on the eight edition of BNM classification. So for small cell lung cancer, there's another system classification, a VA system classification. It's quite similar to TNM, but it's make it simpler by just fitting into limited and extensive disease. For limited disease, it's defined as stage one to three, and the lung cancer can be safely treated within a safety uh, radiation portal. As for extensive disease, this cancer has already spread to distant organs, which we cannot safely radiate to a radical dose within a safe uh, radiation portal. Most of the patients will present at extensive stage for so small cell lung cancer, which I will share towards the end of my talk. So why do we need to stage lung cancer? Because it's very important for the prognostifications. So if you look at the five years overall survival on the stage one lung cancer, with every increment of one centimeter of lung cancer size, there is a significant drop in the five-year overall survival of lung cancer. So every millimeter counts for early detection of uh, lung cancer. But the problem is lung cancer typically doesn't cause signs and symptoms in its earlier stages. So we have uh, identified like a lot of uh, barriers for this early detection. And in our populations, I think the main problem is still uh, low public awareness. So how to detect uh, lung cancer at the early stage? If you look at the early screening studies, multiple institutions have actually carried out uh, screening studies, how to detect uh, lung cancer at this early stage so that we can achieve a uh, curative treatment for patients. The early screening studies involve more than 30,000 of male smokers, whereby they use the annual chest X-ray or the sputum cytology plus minus uh, annual chest X-ray. These screening methods with X-ray and sputum cytology has increased the detection of uh, incidence of lung cancer, thereby followed by resection curative surgery. But overall, there is no survival benefit. So then we have this low-dose computed tomography in 1990s. So this low-dose computed tomography or low-dose CT is the CT that is done without IV contrast and it imposes on less radiation to the patients. 
So it was uh, recognized, I think, in early 1990s on the use of this low-dose CT for the lung cancer screening uh, trials and mostly conducted in US and European countries. So across these trials, we can see the percentage of cancers detected as stage 1 increase after low-dose CT screening. And from the trials, we can see a reduction of mortality rates of about 20 to 24 percent with the use of the low dose CT in the screening of lung cancer. But what about here in Asia? Those studies were done in US and European, whether it's applicable for us to expand the screening eligibility to cover Asian populations, I think is an unknown, unknown question because of the cost effectiveness of lung cancer screening in narrow smokers. As I mentioned earlier, in our populations, we have Asian female patients who are non-smokers. So whether or not it's cost effective to, to, for us to actually implement this uh, lung cancer screening with low dose CT remains unclear. So we look at the healthcare burden on cancer in Malaysia. Cancer, undeniably, one of the five principal causes of national mortality for the past 20 years. And in 2014 itself, you can see cancer contributed to 13% of all deaths in MOH hospitals. And there is currently no population-based cancer screening program in Malaysia. But opportunistic screening is provided for breast cancer mammogram for high-risk patients, cervical cancer, pap smear, or colorectal cancer with a thicker occult blood for individuals at elevated risk. So the policy question here is, for lung cancer, should low-dose CT be used for the screening in the high-risk group in Malaysia? We have actually evaluated this in the health technology assessment uh, report for low-dose CT in the lung cancer screening. And the high-risk group that defined in this report in Malaysia is current or ex-smoker between 50 to 70 years old with a smoking history of 30 pack years or those with a smoking history of 20 pack years with one additional risk factors, for example, family history, uh, those with uh, chronic lung disease, or, or those with the occupational exposure. So what is the review conclusion from this report? So they, the, they concluded that screening for lung cancer using low-dose CT reduced lung cancer-specific mortality and improved early detection of lung cancer. However, low-dose CT had high sensitivity but low specificity when it is used for lung cancer screening among the high-risk group. Hence, low-dose CT may be used for lung cancer screening among the high-risk group in a research environment or for research purpose only. Yeah, so it's not, uh, it's not done in general screening, but only in research uh, environment. So I, I think we have to admit that we have other challenges uh, to impose this low-dose CT screening in Malaysia review of the high prevalence of TB cases in Malaysia. So our lung cancer screening with low dose CT may be complicated by false positive results and leads to unnecessary investigations and anxiety for the patients. And other, other causes would be lack of resources, uncertainty regarding the cost effectiveness and poor public awareness. I think in the past, we, we do have a lung screening uh, pro uh, project using low dose CT in MOH hospital but the study was terminated early because of the poor approval. Yeah, patients uh, refused to participate because of low awareness and they are fearful on the invasive procedures if uh, there is abnormalities found from the low dose CT scan. So now we take a look on the disparities in cancer care. We know that the outcomes in the cancer care will be affected by multiple factors. And importantly, in our setting, apart from the public awareness, another key factor would be patient access and availability of cancer medications. So for the patient access to the lung cancer care and referral guidelines, MOH has actually published a module for healthcare providers for early detection of common cancers and referral pathways. So it's very important for the primary care physicians GPs and our healthcare uh, providers in, in clinic to, to have a high index of suspicions when you see a patient uh, presents with uh, symptoms of lung cancer. Then for the diagnostic pathway, of course, when we see a patient that come to us, we routinely do medical history, physical examinations, then we do a chest x-ray. And there will be a referral pathway that I will share in the next slide on the abnormality of chest x-ray found, so what to do next. 
Then if we find something abnormal from chest X-ray, next thing that we would do is a referral for appointment with specialists to proceed with the relevant imaging and to obtain the tissue for diagnostic confirmations and subsequently refer to the MDD uh, for, for the treatment. So this is a referral pathway that I talked about. So when patients have the signs and symptoms, routinely in the uh, primary healthcare, we'll do a chest X-ray. If the chest X-ray is normal, with low suspicions of lung cancer, then we can continue to observe and manage the patient. If the chest X-ray is abnormal, or there is a high index of uh, suspicions of lung cancer, then the patient should warrant an urgent referral to chest physician for cracking history, examinations, and testing. Okay. So I think the role of GP and health clinic providers uh, can't can be you know, taken lightly. They are the front lines uh, in detecting uh, early lung cancer in our populations, not only to pick up uh, the pot potential patients, but also to educate the patients and to provide the counseling and support for the patient. So moving on to the myth and misconceptions about lung cancer. So uh, I have included a few myths and uh, facts on this. So the first one would be uh, people would tend to think that it's too late uh, if you have smoked for years then to quit uh, smoking. The fact is quitting has almost immediate benefits. Your lung cancer risk will start to drop over time and 10 years after you kick the habit, your odds of getting the disease will be half of what they are now. Another myth would be low tar or light cigarettes are safer than regular. The fact is they are just as risky. Okay, so the next one, pipes and cigars are not a problem. The fact is just like cigarettes, they will put you at risk for cancers of the aerodigestive tract. Then the next myth, smoking is the only risk with the fact that it's the biggest one, but there are others like we have gone through earlier on, like family history, patient cancer history, history of chronic lung disease or air pollution. Okay, then next myth, talcum powder is a cause. The fact has shown that research says there's no clear link between lung cancer and accidentally breathing in talcum powder. The last myth that I want to touch on today, if you have lung cancer, quitting is pointless. The fact is if you stop, your treatment may work better and your side effects could be milder. And if you need a surgery, ex-smokers tend to hear better than smokers. So next, I would roughly talk about the overview of management and treatment options of lung cancer. This is a very large topic. Yeah, if I were to go on to talk on all the latest um, available advancement in this, it's going to be a day course. <laughs> yeah, so for the overview, uh, just to know that lung cancer is not a single disease, nor is it just two diseases like small cell and non-small cell lung cancer. The management of patients with lung cancer is becoming ever more dependent on the knowledge of the pathology of each patient's disease. So now we talk about personalized medicine for every patient's cancer care. And it's recommended for molecular genetic testing at diagnosis, especially for adenocarcinoma. The recommended molecular genetic testing, the mandatory would be EGFR mutation in our setting, plus minus the L and ROS1 gene rearrangement. And PDL1 expression is a predictive marker for immunotherapy. There are other uh, mutations for lung adenocarcinoma which are not routinely tested, but it can be done in the lung panel NGS uh, in, in certain hospitals, but not in the public setting. So EGFR mutations, again, I would want to emphasize nearly 40% of all non-small cell lung cancer cases in Malaysia harbor EGFR mutations. If you don't find EGFR mutations in the lung adenocarcinoma, 13% of them would cover another mutations, out mutations, which is druggable with oral TKI. So for the management of lung cancer, I'll be focusing more on the non-small cell lung cancer and followed by small cell lung cancer. So the management would be guided by the stage uh, of the at presentation for the lung cancer. So I will go through uh, each stage at the next subsequent few slices. So for the treatment options on non-small cell lung cancer, stage one and two. So when patients present with the early stage one and two non-small cell lung cancer, 
the options that can be discussed in good surgery versus radiotherapy. There is no head-to-head -head comparison between these two modalities, but surgery is the preferred uh, local treatment uh, for curative purpose because surgery offers the best chance of a cure and long-term survival. And for the type of surgery, an anatomical resection with lobectomy or segmentectomy is preferred to wedge resection. And the surgery need to include the sampling of at least ipsilateral hyla and medial sinus limb nodes. For those patients who have undergone surgery, after successful surgery, the patients would be referred to oncology uh, to consider for the adjuvant therapy, which I will go through in my next few slides. As for radiotherapy, again, there is no head-to-head -head comparison with is superior. If the tumor cannot be removed surgically or the patient is medically inoperable, then radiotherapy is an option with SBRT or SABER. So this is the surgery types that uh, for the lung cancer. The preferred type of surgery, oncological surgery for non-small cell lung cancer would be lobectomy with a systematic limb node dissection. If that can be done, cannot be done, then segmentectomy can be considered. Wedge resection is far from ideal and pneumonectomy is too morbid to perform. Then for radiotherapy, for those medically inoperable or surgically inoperable, for early stage non-small cell lung cancer less than 5 cm, we can consider treating them by using radiotherapy, SBRT, which stands for stereotactic body radiotherapy, or it can be used interchangeably with SABER, stereotactic ablative radiotherapy. It means that we are trying to deliver a high dose per fractions of radiotherapy to the small target volumes and treated with a highly conformal radiotherapy plan. And usually we will give in about three to five fractions uh, for the primary lung cancer and ideally to achieve a BED of more than 100 gray uh, for a curative dose in primary lung cancer less than five centimeter. So this is another option uh, for early stage lung cancer patients who are diagnosed and inoperable. So for adjuvant therapy, Adjuvant therapy means adjunct treatment after surgery with the aim of cure of microscopic disease to reduce the risk of recurrence and hence improve the survival of lung cancer patients. So for the indications of adjuvant therapy, adjuvant chemotherapy indication post-op nodal positive, the tumor size D3 to 4, and we can also consider uh, adjuvant chemotherapy for those tumor more than 4 cm high grade with the LVSI positive, visceral pleural involvement, or those patient limb nodes were not harvested from the surgery P and X stage. The benefits of adjuvant chemotherapy from a meta-analysis, with the addition of adjuvant chemotherapy four cycles, there is a five-year overall survival benefits of four to five percent. As for adjuvant radiotherapy means radiotherapy after surgery, the role of it is still controversial. We don't routinely offer to patients and the case will have to be discussed in MDT and case-to-case -case basis because of the high toxicity. Then what about for stage three non-small cell lung cancer? Stage three non-small cell lung cancer is a heterogeneous group. Uh, by I think by and large, surgery is still a treatment option if the, if the tumor is deemed operable because stage 3A is those with the medial sinus nodes involvement. So some patients with the medial sinus nodes involvement, we can still consider for surgery after discussions. But if the medial sinus nodes is bulky, more than 3 centimeters, or there are multi-stations, 2 or 3 stations of medial sinus and 2 disease, or entry contralateral medial sinus nodes involvement, then the patient is deemed not suitable for surgery. In this group of patients that is not operable, the other options standard of care would be chemoradiation therapy. So chemoradiation therapy will be given, followed by immunotherapy for one year as per the latest uh, standard of care. And for the chemoradiation therapy, we can give either concurrently radiotherapy together with chemo, or sequentially chemotherapy followed by radiotherapy alone, depending on the patient's performance status. So I'd like to talk about uh, radiotherapy, spend a few slides to talk about this because this is what I'm doing. 
So earlier on uh, in the slide for the small primary tumor uh, that diagnosed stage 1, 2, inoperable, Sable, stereotactic body radiotherapy, uh, that which we use the high dose perfections uh, to treat the patient in about one to five sessions. For the stage three uh, lung small cell, a uh, non uh, lung non small cell lung cancer, we're actually using external beam radiotherapy, which means we use a conventional fractionations in one point eight to two gray perfections, and the patient will require a course of treatment for a few weeks typically about four to six weeks treatment, 20 to 33 sessions, because the patient would like to ask us like, how many times to give per day, how many times per week. So usually for radiotherapy, we will deliver once a day, five courses per week, Monday to Friday, and patient get to rest over weekend. So if we were to deliver a 20 fractions radical treatment, the patient would have to come for treatment for about a month. Okay, so this is what uh, we use to treat the stage three uh, lung cancer. For SRS, SRS is similar as the SBRP, larger, larger dose perfection, but the treatment site is to the brain. For example, a lung cancer with oligomets to the brain, then we can consider treating them with the SRS. Okay, so this slide uh, to show you on the how the radiotherapy technique has advanced over the years. So on the top left corner, if you can see from here, this is the 2D radiotherapy technique uh, in the past, whereby we radiate the patient just based on the bony landmarks. If you can see the radiation field is actually large. Yeah, these are all the radiation fields, means that we just based on the bony landmarks and apply uh, radiotherapy to that whole area. But this has already fallen out of favor nowadays when we have a 3D uh, radiotherapy. The 3D radiotherapy will utilize CT scan, whereby we can delineate the tumor and the treatment plan will be more conformal and reduce the toxicities uh, to the patients. Apart from the 3D radiotherapy, we are doing IMRT as well. IMRT is a more conformal inverse planning technique that we offer to some of the patients uh, with better, better delivery of the radiotherapy and to reduce the toxicities to the normal tissue surrounding. So the techniques that we have include remat, TOMO, depending on the machines. Then on the top right corner, this is the SBRT that I mentioned about, the stereotactic body radiotherapy that we use a high dose to a small uh, volume of tumor. It's a very precise uh, treatment. Radiotherapy not only can be used in a curative setting, we can also offer palliative radiotherapy for symptoms relief in the stage 4 lung cancer patients when the patient presents with pain, spinal cord compression, brain metastasis, bleeding tumor, or SBCO. So these are all a uh, few of the indications that we, we do palliative radiotherapy for our stage 4 lung cancer patients. So now we move on to the management of stage 4 non-small cell lung cancer patients. So non-small cell lung cancer can be adenocarcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma. We will talk on adenocarcinoma first, which is non-squamous. So when you diagnose with a stage 4 lung adenocarcinoma, the three molecular testing that is advisable would be EGFR, L, ROS1. As you can see from here, this is because we have the targetable uh, drug uh, for these mutations. The TKI is an oral medication. For those who do not harbor these targetable mutations, then we have to test for the PDL1 testing. PDL1 PD testing is a predictive marker for immunotherapy. So if you take a look on the review of the historical treatment in the advanced non small cell lung cancer, in the past, it's very easy. The treatment would be just chemotherapy single agent or combinations of chemotherapy. With the chemotherapy combinations, you will see the median overall survival of the stage four lung cancer is about short months, seven, eight months. And the median progression free survival is even shorter, 3.4 to 4.2 months. So very short. But for nowadays, lung cancer stage four is no longer a death sentence with the new, uh, new drugs and all the emerging uh, targetable uh, mutations with the uh, oral TKI. So this slide is just to show the milestone for the treatment for the non-small cell lung cancer. If you can see for the last two decades, 
there's a lot of uh, new drugs that are coming out to the market. Then for the targeted therapy, for those uh, small uh, non-small cell lung cancer, adenocarcinoma, EGFR, ALT, and ROS1. Yeah, they are the, they are the more common um, driver mutations that we usually test for. And the medications that are available in KKM indication first line setting would be the first generation PKI for EGFR. So I would like to draw your attention to this EGFR TKI is because uh, with this EGFR TKI, we can see a lot of improvement in the lung cancer patient survival in non-small cell lung cancer. So these are all quite old studies actually because this drug has been in markets for almost 20 years. They're all the first, first uh, generation TKI as compared to the conventional chemotherapy. You will see with the conventional chemotherapy, just now we learned that PFS is about three, four months but with the oral TKI, EGFR inhibitor, the PFS improved to 9.2 9 months and it ranges about 9 to 12 months actually. So you will see a lot of improvement if the patient's diagnosed upfront with an EGFR mutant non-small cell lung cancer, TKI compared to uh, chemotherapy. So for the that is for the adenocarcinoma. <clears throat> As for the squamous cell carcinoma, stage four, most of the time squamous cell carcinoma they don't harbor the driver mutations, only in rare cases. But PDL1 is the testing for the immunotherapy. In those with the PDL1 uh, expressions positive means more than 1%. And this patient can be considered for chemotherapy plus minus immunotherapy. And the progress in lung cancer treatment, if you can see from 1970s to the present time, immunotherapy is like the new hope and hype uh, in, in this day and age, everyone talking about immunotherapy. But what is it? What is it, uh, immunotherapy? How, it, how does it work? If we want to know how immunotherapy works, we need to know on how cancer forms. So we need to know the carcinogenesis of uh, cancer. There is this hallmark of uh, cancer. When I was studying for exam, there were just six hallmarks of cancers, but in recent years, it has gone up to more than 10 hallmarks of cancers in the carcinogenesis uh, process. So for immunotherapy, we are mainly targeting at this, for this hallmark, avoiding immune destructions. So we know in the normal human body, our immunity, body immunity, is able to eliminate uh, cancer cells. But at one point, the cancer cells may evade our body's immunity and then to manifest and become and, and attack the body. So the use of immunotherapy is actually to unmask those cancer cells so that our body immunity is able to recognize them again and then to take on and tackle on these cancer cells. So for the first line treatment in the immunotherapy era, we are talking about uh, monotherapy, immunotherapy, or combination immunotherapy, or combination immunotherapy with chemotherapy. There's a lot of studies uh, coming up. And you can see just in the past few years alone, there are so many studies and so many immunotherapies that have been approved uh, for the first line use for advanced non-small cell lung cancer. Yeah, it's actually very overwhelming. So for future directions of lung cancer treatment, apart from the advancement that we have seen, I think we need to understand more on the lung cancer and overcoming the treatment resistance. Because after some time with our patients on treatment, they would develop the treatment resistance. So it's unmet need for us to identify those treatment resistant genes so that we can target them from upfront to prolong the survival better. The next future directions will be combination of treatments like we are seeing combination of IO immunotherapy with a chemotherapy, but we need to balance between improving outcome versus the risk and toxicities, especially financial toxicities, and for patient selection with reliable biomarkers. And recently, we are also seeing immunotherapy and TKI have moved from at one stage in stage four, at one stage to new adjuvant adjuvant setting in earlier settings. So these are all future directions of lung cancer treatment. And this slide just to introduce you on the possible resistance that can happen uh, in the EGFI TKI therapy that patient uh, had the EGFI TKI therapy after some times. 
they progress. And when we test on the tumor, you'll find, find out that they actually develop resistant uh, to the EGF IPKI and they will have different types of the mutations. This is one example. The second example would be those on the ELK inhibitor, resistance uh, to the ELK inhibitor with the um, mechanism of resistance. So the upcoming phase three trials with novel agents in first line and once non small cell lung cancer, a combination treatment, immunotherapy plus chemotherapy and with the PKIs. So there are a lot of uh, clinical trials that are ongoing across the world. I think there are thousands, few thousands of them that are currently on, ongoing in different centers. What about in HPP, our, cent our center? Our center is one of the sites selected for the lung cancer clinical trials. We are now having a few ongoing uh, phase two, three lung cancer trials in HPP. If you are interested to know more or if you identify some eligible patient that you think that you will want to talk to us, please feel free to approach us so that we can together improve the patient care because we know that most of the uh, new medications that have been emerging in the market is not available in our KKM drug formulary. So the best way for the patients to obtain the new medication would be via clinical trials. All right, so I'm actually almost at the end of my talk. I would just spend a few minutes to talk about small cell lung cancers. So we are done with the non-small cell lung cancers. So now we move on to the small cell lung cancer. Small cell lung cancer comprises about 15 to 20% of lung cancer in my earlier slide, remember? Then we know that about two thirds of patients present at extensive stage. The, the chemotherapy combinations, four to six cycles, was the backbone of treatment, regardless of the stage that was in the past chemotherapy. And we know that despite with the poor prognosis of small cell lung cancer, they have a high chemo response rate, 70 to 90%. They are chemosensitive. So for the small cell lung cancer patients, poor prognosis, usually diagnosed at one stage. If you do see them, please refer them to us as early as possible. Do not delay the referral because uh, the, the survival of extensive small cell lung cancer without treatments would be short months. So for limited stage small cell lung cancer, limited stage lung, small cell lung cancer means those with stage 1 to 3 and can be encompassed within a safe radiation portal. For those very early stage, T1, 2 tumors, small tumors, less than 5 centimeters, surgery is still the main modality, but we hardly see this group of patients in our setting. I have never seen one actually. In overseas, I think they have seen, they have seen the patient's small cell lung cancer with early stage that warrants surgery because of the screening, but here in our population, we hardly see this group of patients. So usually the group of patients that we see in small cell lung cancer will be those with locally at one stage three or extensive uh, stage with metastasis. So those with the stage three locally at one patients, we can consider for a uh, chemo radiation therapy, either concurrent or sequential chemo radiations. So after treatment, if patient able to achieve complete response or partial response on re-imaging and remain with a good performance status, then we will consider prophylactic cranial irradiation. This is because small cell lung cancer tends to match the brain, and there are studies to show that with prophylactic cranial irradiation means we radiate the brain prophylactically without brain metastasis, it's able to improve the survival in this group of patients. Then for extensive stage small cell lung cancer, immunotherapy has come into picture. Yeah, as you can see, but we don't have the medication available in these indications. So the mainstay of treatment in our setting now is chemotherapy, then palliative radiotherapy to symptomatic sites. But after palliative chemotherapy, if patient able to achieve partial response, then we will consider consolidative thoracic radiotherapy uh, to improve the survival as well as the prophylactic cranial irradiation if patient do not present with brain metastasis uh, at, at front. All right, so I'm at the end of my talk. These are my references. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Sam, for that amazing presentation or uh, sharing about lung cancer. I think even for me, actually, personally, knowing, seeing all these new treatment options out there, it actually gives me hope. 
to know that some of our patients who actually are suspected with lung cancer can get the adequate treatment and the survival rate is still there. I, I, I feel very encouraged after this. Actually, Dr. Sam, I, have, uh, I personally have two questions for you. Uh, then later we'll, we'll get the questions from the audience. Um, okay. Do you have any success stories from primary care in lung cancer pickup and pitfalls from primary care and lung cancer pickup? Means uh, from primary care, they, they refer early. Oh, great. Uh, this, this primary care did well or this primary care didn't refer early or there was a pitfall in that situation. And there any short stories you don't mind sharing? Uh, I'm I'm sure they are, yeah. But but because uh I'm oncologist, so yeah. usually all these primary care they was like involved in the diagnostic pathway of the lung cancer patient, and oncology we will see the patient after the patient was di diagnosed. Ah. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> so yeah, I'm sure there are stories about that. But <laughs> unfortunately, when the patient present to us, they are already diagnosed uh, either right. for adjuvant treatment after surgery or for the advanced uh, disease treatment. But for those with the early stage that referred to us for adjuvant uh, treatment, I I'm sure that uh, there will be stories behind it for in which the primary care has played a role. That's very good. Actually, I, I like that you shared our national guideline for screening for lung cancer. So if mm -hmm. 50 years old or 70 years old with... Uh, uh, with 30 year pack year history or 20 year pack year history with occupational exposure, uh, send them for low dose CT scan, currently a current or past smoker. I think that's a very good thing that we can pick up from our side as well. Uh, actually, for you personally, uh, Dr. Sam, what are the challenges you face in lung cancer treatment in your practice? Lung cancer treatment, I think we do see a lot of challenges, I would say. Yeah, because I think the stage of diagnosis is, is remains the main challenge to us. We still see, I think, more that we don't have the latest census because you can see the National Cancer Report is from 2012 to 2016. We don't have the latest national report, but from the clinical practice that we see daily in, in our weekly lung MDD, I think more than half of the patients will be stage 4 lung cancer. They have been referred to us. Yeah, it's, we are still seeing the same numbers, you know, of the stage 4 uh, lung cancer. Rarely we will see uh, some early stage uh, lung cancer for adjuvant treatment, but mostly still uh, stage four. I think that would be the largest challenge. The next uh, challenge that I would think of would be the access, the access of the patients to the healthcare and the public awareness, as well as the access to the medications. Yeah, there's still a lot of uh, room for improvement in the lung cancer care in our country. Definitely. I think that's... Um... I think the study that they did previously and then it was, it was discontinued is actually such a shame that people mm. who are actually indicated for it they didn't come for it because it could have been a very good jump off point for policy. Uh, yeah, yeah. I remember when like, I yeah, I remember when I was medical officer, this study just started. And then I didn't see see that study published. Then when I Googled it again, it was terminated already. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, oh my gosh. It's okay. per study, yeah. The name of the study is per study. Study, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's actually such a shame. Yeah, actually, uh, so I've got a question from one of our uh, GPs on our on our YouTube. They were actually asking, um, so this is a Dr. Amin, he's asking, what are some of the chest x-ray findings that I should worry or pick up about that is clear-cut lung cancer? Means I say in my practice, right, primary care, I see a chest x-ray, oh, okay, that is confirmed uh, lung cancer. What, is there anything that I should, like, okay, immediate or urgent referral or I should think about referring really? Yeah. I'm not the best person to answer this question. I think the chest physician will be the best person. But then for me, the clear-cut lung cancer would be pure effusions, carcinomatosis changes. But for the early lung cancer stage, if you see a solid tumor, a solid mass from the chest X-ray that was not present before, and clinically patients has no sign and symptom of infections, rule out TB, then that should raise a high index of suspicions for referral to a uh, test physician for the CT thorax and further investigation. Okay, that's, that's very good. Thanks for the sum. So basically, if there's any solid lesion that, and the patient doesn't have any symptoms, that, that is something alarming already, right? Yeah, they not should. infection, yeah, not TB. Because in our region, I think still a lot of TB cases. Yeah, TB until proven otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> common adage is common for a reason. Uh, yeah, common thing is still common. So I guess this is really challenging, yeah. That's that's good. I hope that answers your question, Doctor Amit. I got uh got Doctor Leaf actually from uh, again from YouTube. Um, I want to ask, what is the treatment burden or treatment cost difference between early versus late stage lung cancer? Do you have like an, a ballpark figure how much it costs to treat early stage lung cancer versus late stage lung cancer? 
I think it depends. First of all, it depends on the subtype of the lung cancer. But then if we can detect the cancer early and treat them early, curative treatment, I suppose the, the treatment cost on the medication would be so much lesser as compared to the at one stage. Because when the patient present with at one stage, meaning those patients would have to be put on some form of treatment until they progress or until they are unable to tolerate the toxicities. And depending on the subtypes of the cancer, as you can see uh, on this, all the mole new molecular tests and new driver mutations and immunotherapy, the cost of the advanced lung cancer treatment would be definitely more than uh, the early stage lung cancer at diagnosis. Yeah, I, I hope that answers your questions. Uh, Dr. Lee, I hope that answers your question. And that's, uh, that's actually very good to realize because not, not just lung cancer, but all cancers is much more easier, faster, and cheap if it's early, if it's early detected. It's much more faster, <laughs> easier, and cheaper to treat if it's early, earlier, earlier cancer, stage cancer. Mm -hmm. um, so actually, we got a question from Dr. Lee. Uh, it's a Nirmal, uh, Dr. Nirmala Ahmad Lingam, who's an FMS. What is the management of Tagriso side effects? Or in other words, Alcemidronib, uh, which is an EGFR plus and SCLC. Uh, target, targeted therapy. Oh, thank you for the question, Dr. Nirmala. Do you have experience on the use of this osimatinib? Yeah, which is good. Osimatinib is the third generation TKI in EGFR mutant lung cancer. So for, for the EGFR TKI, generally the common side effects that we have to manage would include acneform rashes. Very, very of, often the patients would complain of this acneform rashes, especially with the osimatinib. And when the patient develops toxicities, uh, out from the TKI, we will have to grade the toxicities and manage the patient appro uh, appropriately according to the grading of the toxicity. Apart from the acneform rashes, the other toxicities uh, that commonly seen would, would be peronychia, the change, the new changes, peronychia. So these are the common um, side effects of osimatinib, uh, diarrhea. Some patients will have diarrhea as well. And very small portion of patients would have these QTC prolongations, which we have to wash out with the monitor with the ECG. And so these are the common ones that we have encountered in clinic. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Sam. So basically, to, sum to summarize that, well, basically, uh, it depends on the toxicity level and then to watch out for the common ones, right? I hope that answers your question, uh, Dr. Nimala. It was a very good question. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we are going to... So we are still waiting. We don't have any more questions at the moment, Dr. Sam. I think it may be a good time to wrap up. But before we wrap up, do you have any closing statements? Any any uh, any personal statements you want to give to the GPs or to our primary care physicians or primary care colleagues? Uh, what uh, what is the actually? There's one question that came in, but since we're on this topic, uh, what what is the like one summarized what you want all of us to do or to learn or to take home from this to really drive from lung cancer? Yeah, I think, I think thank, thank you for, for attending the talk today. For me, I think all the GPs, uh, primary care physicians, healthcare clinic providers, they are really the true frontliners in guarding the lung cancer in our country. Because an oncologist, you know, we see patients after they diagnose and they refer to us. Yeah, we are not very much, you know, involved in the diagnostic pathway of a lung cancer. So I think it's a pivotal role of uh, those in as frontliners to have to be vigilant high index of suspicions again, even though common thing is common infections uh, in our regions, but if you do see uh, with a repeat X-ray after infection resolve with a persistent lung mass, please refer to the uh, chest physician in hospital for a CT thorax. We don't, we don't do a CT thorax, a low dose CT in our setting like as per screening, but then uh, for those patients with a suspicious lung mass on chest X-ray, they would warrant for a CT thorax for diagnostic purpose. Yeah. So there's actually one interesting question that just came in from a Dr. Mm -hmm. Chong Bi Lee from a GP in Dr. Uh, is there any association or feedback on vaping and lung cancer till today? Any studies done so far? Oh, what? Sorry? Vaping, vaping, <laughs> e-cigarettes, vaping oh, and lung cancer. <laughs> vaping, no, no. Yeah. Ah, vaping, vaping, e-cigarettes. Yeah. So because it's a very hot thing now, right? Vaping, and uh, especially among the youth. So is there any association with lung cancer so far? That is a very interesting question. Sir. I have I have not really looked into that that part of vaping association with lung cancer, but but I suppose I suppose it would it would pose a risk for lung cancer as well. But then I think we don't have a study to prove it as yet. Yeah, that's, that's very true. Actually, Dr. Samir, you're absolutely right. 
mm. there's no study yet. So yeah. patients usually, because I, when I go on, like, on the field and all, I see patients, they always ask me, yeah. oh, uh, anything and uh, lung cancer, how? I said, okay, you can be our, you can be our <laughs> test subject. You can be our research. <laughs> you can be our research. Uh, because there's not, there's no, there's no association yet, but by the theory, all, what you say is rightly true, there is going to be, pose a risk. Because all the chemicals is, is uh, legal for consumption, not for, not for inhalation. So that is definitely a risk. Thank you for that, Dr. Sama. And Dr. Chong, I hope that answered your question. And I believe, I think that's, I think that they'll, they'll cover it for today. Um, Dr. Som, thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you so much for your research. I, I see I see all those personalized slides. I know you work very hard on them. And I love that you presented it very well to each other. I think uh, for me, I took home, took home a lot from this. Uh, thank you to everyone on Docuity for listening on into this. Really appreciate it. And uh, well, have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Som. Bye, everyone. Okay, thank you, everyone, for the attention. Thank you, Dr. Jason, and thank you, Docuity and National Cancer Society Malaysia for the invitations. Bye. Bye.